The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Dr. Paul Molnar discusses how God's will gets complicated when it intersects with our choices. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. A lot of people have the idea that God is unchangeable because He's perfect. In other words, if God were to do something different or if He were to change His mind or let's say answer a prayer uh, from somebody, then that would mean that the way He was before the change uh, wasn't perfect and he had to become perfect or he was perfect and if he changed he wasn't perfect before so therefore using that kind of logic uh, God never changes and he therefore had to decide everything that would ever happen ahead of time and everything plays itself out that way if that were true then how can we expect him to answer prayers and interact with us in a real and present way if that were true, yes, you couldn't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, what's a better way of looking at so that? So, I think a better way of looking at that is to say that God is free and and knows events that will happen, precisely as genuinely contingent historical events as He wills them to exist, non-deterministically. I think Torrance is quite good on this, pointing out that in, in Greek thinking, this whole notion of necessity, logical necessity and determinism uh, seem to be endemic to the way they think about creation, about reality. So that leads to the ideas of fate and so on. Uh, so, so Torrance would want to say, I think rightly, that, that Christianity really Christianized Hellenism rather than the idea that Hellen Hellenism you know, that Christianity was Hellenized. That is Greek thought. Greek thought, <laughs> Greek thought, exactly. So, um, so and I suppose for, you could add to that the epitome of Greek thought, that is, of projecting sensual images into the deity, was Arius. Um, so, in so other words, thinking of, of God in, in the, with, as having the same kinds of passions and so on that human beings Correct, have. correct. And then thinking of God deterministically would be sort of an extension, extension of that sort of fatalistic, necessitarian, logical thinking. Since God, the Christian God, is a living God and is free and loving, when he acts toward creation as he does act, uh, it's from the overflowing abundance of who he is. It's not out of need. It's not because of imperfection. It's not because he needs to fill something up in himself. So that, so that when he creates the world, he creates the world out of love according to his own wisdom for his own purpose. Sometimes that purpose may seem unclear to us, uh, but he has a purpose and it's not an arbitrary sort of purpose and it's not, it's certainly not a deterministic sort of purpose that, that suggests that he's encumbered by his relation with us. So the existence of the world in, is, is a really distinct entity, it's not a threat to his to God's uh, being, to His sovereignty, to His sovereignty. So th that would it that would mean that if that there are any number of choices a person can make, and yes. any number of paths a person's life can take, yes. without God determining that way ahead of time or before all time, and yet that is still under God's control, and it's still part of what He is working out for His redemptive purposes. I would say yes with one proviso. Uh, I would, I'd like to remove the, the word determined from that and say that God knows those events as free events that we will do, but he knows them precisely because he's not encumbered or by the past or by the future. By that I mean that he's, or, he's, he's always the one he is, transcending time and within time, so that he's not losing part of his being when the past goes away and the present moves into the future. 
uh, and he's not not yet because there's a future. He's present to all times because he's God uh, and eternal. But that doesn't mean, now Torrance actually gets into some of this stuff and so does Bart. That doesn't mean that God doesn't have his own time. He has his own time, but it's his unique time in which he, he doesn't pass away as we do. In time, our time is marked by its, its, its limitations and by the fall. So we don't really have time. We have no control over time. But time, created time, must find its meaning always in God's eternal time. And God's eternal time, however, is, is, is utterly unique to him. So, so I think both Bart and Torrance actually do say that God has time because he has time for us in Jesus Christ. And that time is actually the healing of our time. So that when we share in Christ's eternal humanity, because, because Christ, although he wasn't eternally existent, otherwise he wouldn't be truly human, now exists eternally as the risen and ascended Lord. When we share in that, we actually have eternal life, life, that, life without end, you might say. Um, so since God is not encumbered by the limitations of past, present, and future as we are, uh, he can know things that are future for us precisely as events that are, are freely determined, contingently determined, and not necessarily determined in and a deterministic sense. Contingently determined means what? It means that, that, that they're totally dependent on God's purpose and will to be what they are. It means that they might not even be at all, or they might be differently, depending on, upon God's will for them. And sometimes a person who, or a Christian will will get the idea that in a, in a given situation there's only one right decision they could make and that they must seek out what God's will would be for them in this situation. They assume that there is only one possibility of what God's will might be for them and that if they make the wrong choice that would be a disaster but so they want to make sure that their decision is God's will so they enter into whatever regimen that they think might help, whether it be prayer and fasting or seeking counsel or whatever. And of course, oftentimes they end up, regardless of the counsel, they seek doing what they want anyway. <laughs> but um, is there only one right decision? And, and is God's will always a specific thing that we must do on a specific decision that there's only one will of God and then everything else would be, would be wrong? How does God work with us, uh, in other words? How does he interact with us on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that is not an easy question. No, that's a, that's a toughie. Uh, I'm thinking back to Bart's ethics that he, he develops in, um, in volume two, part two of the Church Dogmatics, and then in three, four, where he talks about the divine command. And uh, if I remember that correctly, it's been a very long time since I've read that material. But if I remember what... What he argues in that, it is that God's command is infallibly reaches each person in their particular circumstances and makes itself known to them as his will because it is a permission. It's a, it's a, it's a freedom to serve him, which enables that person to really be what God wants them to be. So one of the marks then of actually coming up against the legitimate divine command is the fact that it's, it's a freedom. It's not an enslavement. It, it, it never says to the person, if you do this, 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 and this, then you will get that, 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 and that. Never. It's always a freedom to obey God himself. So there really is only one possibility, but, it, it, but again, not in, in a legalistic sense, that you have four possibilities there and you choose one and if you get the right one well then things go well for you and if you get choose one of the other three well then you're in trouble uh, that i think that would be the wrong way to think about this sort of interaction so we really do interact with god it's true but we're not set in a position where bart would often say and i think Torrance would certainly follow him in this uh, that like hercules at the crossroads we, become, we, we choose be, between two possibilities, and if we choose the right one, then everything's good. And if we choose the wrong one, 
well, everything's not good. Because part, partly because our wills are enslaved to sin and are freed by God in Christ to, to the, for service of God. So, so love of God and love of neighbor, in Bart's thinking then, means the, the divine command that reaches each individual in different circumstances in, at different times in each person's life. Um, and that's, that's why prayer is indeed necessary, right? To discern precisely what that is uh, and then to obey. Uh, it's, not, it's not as it were a test, you know, where if you, if you get this one right, then you're okay, and if, if you don't, it's really, it's really a, a freedom, a, a, a freeing of a person from, from, from the illusion that they could actually sort of determine God's will by their choices, because they can't. They can only obey. So in a particular circumstance, let's say you were called to, um, to actually do a, a, a kind Christian act at a, at a given moment. Uh, you, you either do it or you don't do it. You either obey or you don't. It's not a question of sort of trying to figure out which is the right way to go. Some people will, will struggle over whether they should buy this car or that car. Yes. Uh, they need a car, they need to get one for whatever reason, and so, but they need to get the whole church to pray for them to make the right decision. Yes. It's as though they, they think there's only one right choice they can make. And sometimes the pastors of some certain types of churches will enter into that yes. and presume to speak for God and tell them, no, you should get the white car because that's, you know what I mean. I, I do, guess. I do. We can bring so much almost superstition right. to every decision. Yes. Uh, assuming that we have to be so careful that we stay within the will of God, but pretending that we know or struggling over the fact that we don't know. Anyway. That, that doesn't sound very freeing, does it? No, it sounds... Uh, it's it's uh, kind of unnerving, you might say. Yeah. So I, I would rather say that in such circumstances, we can, in, we can entrust our decisions to the care of God and to God's forgiving grace, yeah. so that if we've made what turns out to be a bad decision, a year from now, sell the car, get yeah. another one. Don't worry about it. So I, I think we can trust in God's loving care and in the fact that uh, he will be, bring good even out of bad decisions. More of a lifestyle of, of trusting God to help us through the decisions we make. Correct. And, 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 and trusting him, trusting in his forgiving grace yes. when things don't go exactly the way they, they, they should. Yeah, there are, there are certain principles anybody can use in trying to make a wise decision. You want to weigh the pros and cons. You Absolutely. want to get wise counsel. And you want, to, you want to listen to, you know, good judgment about it and so on. Of course. But then at some point you have to make a decision. and An informed decision. So, like, especially with regard to cars. I mean, if I'm going to buy a, a, a new car, I want to know every detail about that car, you yeah. know. And, uh, there are many so things would, we can obsess over. And you could. That's true. <laughs> But, um, but when it boils down to it, we want to bring the, the, our, our Christian life, our, our walk with Christ, into whatever circumstance uh, or decision we might make. And sometimes we make poor decisions. And, That's right. And, and we still bring with that our faith to, that God will help us through. Yes. Sometimes we make a good decision and we still bring with that our, our faith that God will bless us, help us, uh, help us to use it rightly, not foolishly, and so on. And one of, the, one of the really good things in that is this, that, that we don't have to worry about whether our decisions in the last analysis were right or wrong in a certain sense. Or because super, Christ promises or to make good, make good for us. Yeah. So, so he's, in a real sense, responsible for us. We are responsible, of course, to him and to God, but, but because he has made himself responsible for us, we don't have to make a final judgment about what, what we're doing. We leave that to him. We can and at the same time, we, we realize that decisions have consequences. That's right. We do a foolish thing. That's right. Then it's going to have consequences. Which we do at least once a day. Yeah, right? Perhaps most maybe of the time. Maybe twice a day. Yeah. And that, again, that raises opportunities to trust God to have mercy on us. Well, in and, that, of that. and that's the whole point of prayer, right? Some of the uh, botched decisions that we make point us once again to, to our utter need to rely on God's forgiving grace. And that's not something we can control by plotting and planning every little detail of our lives out and then getting the whole church to pray for it. You know, that, uh, that it's not raining on uh, Thursday morning.
when I leave for our vacation. You know, you know that so, sort of thing. But it may these be are the kinds of requests that sometimes come in. And know? then people might conclude from that, that, well, since it is raining, therefore God doesn't love me. Yeah. Right. So, so that, that concept of God is an all too human a concept, I think. To what degree does God function or operate or, let's say, interact with us on a personal level with, the, with our daily life? In other words, is it, is it a matter of how much we bring him in or is it a matter of that he's always present but he lets us make our own decisions and make mistakes and live with the consequences or uh, is it hands off, he's out there watching us, you know, for whatever reason or, or how does that work? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the God that we know in Jesus Christ is not a hands off deity because he, he has loved us while we were still sinners and powerless to love him. And he continues to love us in exactly the same way in Jesus Christ. But the, and there's no limit to, to, to his approach to us. So I would say that, it, that we can only love because God empowers us to love at any given moment. So I would say God is deeply involved in each and every moment of our lives. But sometimes we're so busy that we don't see that and we don't pay attention to that or we look right past it toward our own agenda, which when put into effect, will effectively enable us to sort of redefine who God is and what revelation is and what salvation should mean to make ourselves feel comfortable. So uh, God is definitely not a, a distant deistic deity. That's the dualism that Torrance is always referring to that is so problematic. And I would say that because the God who meets us in Jesus Christ meets us in a myriad of different forms, in a myriad of different experiences, and is, is never far off, but is sometimes hidden to us in our own experience because we're not really paying attention or not really trusting in God per se, or sort of reinventing the God we want instead of trusting in God as he is. Isn't another form of reinventing the God we want to, um, to take the approach of, I mean, you hear in some conversations, well, you know, the Lord uh, told me to, uh, uh, to take this job, or the, the Lord told me to, that we should move to Kenya and, and, and be a missionary. Yes. Um, and sometimes, the, you know, the whole church knows it's a foolish decision somebody's making, and yet <clears throat> they're convinced that the Lord told them that, and that and they, they bring God into, in their own mind, into every decision they make as though this is what the will of God was for me. It's as though I don't have to take responsibility for my own decisions because God told me to do this. Yeah. So well, who are you to tell me that this was foolish? Well, now, that, you know, that, now that could just as easily be a manipulation of God's will. Exactly. So that's a problem. Um, for example, God told me this morning I should be a chemical engineer. I don't know a thing about chemical engineering, but God told me to do it, so I'm going to go and do that. Well, I think you should have to, if you get such a revelation, supposedly, you should have to then look at, at the, the, the abilities that you do have. Um, your talents, where your life has been to, the, to this point, and ask yourself seriously whether that is something that God is asking you to do. And I, actually, I don't think God is actually telling me to do that at all, you know. <laughs> and I think actually Bart think was told... He's telling me that, that you're supposed to do I that. should be a chemical engineer, right? Because <laughs> I utterly failed at theology, you know, so I might as well be a chemical engineer. But Bart once uh, said, of, uh, I think to someone who was asking about whether or not they should... Uh, you know, uh, uh, engage in the business of theology, uh, well, you have to look at whether or not you have the, uh, the temperament, the, the, uh, the qualities that would lead to someone who would be a good theologian. You might have none of the, those things. And if that's true, then the, that's a sign of God's interacting with you. It really is. So you have to be sensible and use common sense. I think this happens more often than... than um than it ought to with, with people who take up a missionary plan. In other words, they will decide or come to the conclusion that God is calling them to some sort of missionary service and they'll pluck their family up without regard to what, how the effect on the children of moving to a, in a new country, a new culture and so on, uh, without really understanding what they're getting into. They may have heard a, a presentation or they may have heard of a need and they feel some sort of a twinge of conscience or something about the needs, and so they assume that that is God moving them to uh, to make this huge life-changing decision, and 
uh, and I'll, sometimes it just becomes a, you know, a major mistake for the family. Yeah. But, but they're so convinced that this is what God wants them to do. Um, I, I don't know that there's any solution to that because we all stand prey to that in one way or another. That's true. But, that's uh, and that's an extremely difficult decision. But the point that you made about that person needing to look at the overall effect on, on the entire family could weigh very heavily, should weigh very heavily in that, such a decision, I would think. And getting good counsel from, from not just the person and people who want them to go, but from people who have been there, done Absolutely. that, and from their pastors, from other counselors who, and listening to, to the uh, suggestions and ideas from, from more than one point of view on the topic. No question, I, I'm, th I'm thinking of uh, uh, Tom, Tom Torrance's own life when he was asked by Bart to follow him in, ba in Basel. And uh, he said that was one of the hardest decisions of his life. And he, uh, he decided not to go because he didn't want to uproot his children from school and bring them into a setting where they would have to speak and learn in German and so on and so forth. So, and he was never sorry that he made that decision, but it was a very difficult decision. So, um, so he had to weigh all of those family issues and so on and so forth. And in retrospect, I think it was a good decision. So yeah, you know, just because that. a thing might seem spiritual or holy in some way, doesn't mean that you can't continue to serve God effectively in any, any other way absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. But we sometimes substitute uh, going out and doing some kind of a seemingly spiritual thing for trying to make up for all the other problems in our life to feel better Very about, true. Our, about our walk with God. Very true. We have an amazing ability to deceive ourselves. And isn't that, isn't that part of what we learn from Trinitarian theology in the fact that Christ has, is already everything for us and, and our, our trust is in Him to be everything we need to be. And that's why when Bart was to, talked about Christian vocation, he said the Christian preacher and teacher should po point vigorously toward Christ as the one who calls us toward His purposes and not toward Christian experience as the way forward in these matters. I think he was right. It's often hard to uh, face the fact that, that maybe the best place for us is, to, is right where we are. That's right. Being who we should be in Christ as opposed to finding a, a new and exciting place somewhere else that uh, promises. Uh, but may not deliver. It may not deliver. Absolutely true, I couldn't agree more. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.